It's the guy's home, so it's we're sort of privileged to work here. The first art is very varied. We've got the two houses. The one house is much more lively and noisy. The guys have profound physical and mental disabilities. Their health needs are quite great as well. So, you know, it's a balancing act within the home of health, activities and inclusion. We have a project set up, and at the beginning, I have to say, we were quite negative, I think, at the beginning. We couldn't really envisage some of the technology working. I think I was probably a bit, we'll give it a go, but I'll let you know it won't work. <laughs> but actually, I think I gave it a go. I thought, oh, give it a go. But actually, that didn't work, but if it was like this, it would. Over time, and looking at things and finding out different ways of doing things. Now we're much more enthusiastic and we can see it enabling our guys to do things in their home. Because some of our clients can't move themselves, we started with using the pendants so as they could call for help, just as they had a voice to say, hello, I'm here, kind of thing. Now we've used, started to use buttons so they can turn on their own tellers. Uh, I'm sorry that was only part of the clip and I don't know what's happened to that. Um, but we've got some time, I'll carry on. What you see later on in there is some of the people hitting buttons to say, can I have a cup of tea? Um, can I go out, please? Giving people a voice. Um, and when people talk about having challenging behaviour, how many of you would last 24 hours if someone came in every 20 minutes and changed your TV uh, channel to something you didn't like? Uh, so we've tried to use the technology with people with multiple and complex needs and finding that we're now talking about people's abilities, not their disabilities. So I don't know what happened to that clip. I've got some other ones, so fingers crossed. Light switches. Small steps, but for these guys, they're huge. It's going to be one of those days. And we use it as well to control lights if they're doing physio to make it much more fun and interactive. And then we've got throughout this house buttons that can ask for things. Can I go out? Can have a snack, just things that they ask for regularly. Very daunting to start off with, but then as we've sort of been more introduced to it, it's you can see the benefit the guys get from it and also the staff. I think the buttons we've got on, on the walls are good, you know, we've got them what talk, you know, can have a cup of tea and I want to go out. But obviously there's, there's still a lot more out there, isn't there, to explore really. This is just the start, I think. The guys' reactions once once they've pressed a button and it said, "Can I, you know, I'm thirsty. Can I have a cup of tea?" And we turn around and acknowledge that, you know, there'll be a big smile, hands up in the air, or clapping. So they're definitely feeling heard. And uh, once you accomplish some, something together, something new, something good, it encourages you to go another step and see what else is out there for you to to do. The big issue when I first came to Clementi was how was somebody like Sarah and Joe going to call for us when they needed us because they couldn't operate anything that we had. Sarah now can call us from her bed, from the bathroom, from her wheelchair, wherever she is. It just means it's, you know, you've got a voice. Because they have such profound disabilities physically, it's just finding what suits that individual. And it does take time. I mean, I think we've used buttons for Katie, it's not worked, so we've gone to a mouse map. Tried a mouse map for Sarah, it's too sensitive. So it's just getting the right thing for each individual. I think, like, Matthew, I mean, he'll, he, he can move himself. So he goes down to his room. He likes being on his own, but he likes having his telly on. Now, if we're all busy, he can now just go off and put it on. That's just got to be so much better than waiting for a member of staff to happen to notice you're sat in front of the telly. And I think probably like for Jo, because she's quieter, I think possibly in the past you'd miss a sign for I want a drink, whereas now at least she can press something that's kind of shouting, I want a drink. So that's really good. The biggest challenge is once you've actually found out what does benefit is, 
is using it, supporting the staff to use it. Days can be very busy. There's a lot of personal care. There's, you know, and just every day-to-day -day routine in this, these houses is busy. So it's, it's getting the staff to learn and appreciate how much it means to the individuals um, to actually make sure that the equipment's used, that it's turned on. Um, we've had issues with, like, night staff have always turned the electric off because that's the way health and safety does it. But if we turn the plug off, they can't use the switch to turn the light on and things like that. So it's been changing the culture of the way the staff think. I do work in a different way now because you, you can see the results. You can see that actually they're so much happier being able to control bits of their life. And it goes across everything in their home as well. So trying to find more things that they can do. And I'm always sort of looking out for, oh yeah, Sarah could do that, Matt could do that. So I suppose it's just opened your eyes up a little bit. I think it's when you stand from a distance and they actually are doing these things without you there. But once they actually do that on their own without having to be reminded is what makes it all worthwhile. I feel quite bad that I thought it wouldn't work at the beginning because like now it's so obvious it was always going to work. Um, we've got a Twitter account, apparently. I'm not quite sure why. Do you want to explain, Justin? Yeah, so, right, so that is the Twitter account. If you go on there now and then and give us your comments, that would be greatly... Yeah, I get a bonus, apparently. Uh, when we started doing this, it came out of a European project. Uh, my background is in operations. I was a, a practitioner. So like a good old social worker asked why we were doing it. And we found at the time there was no real eth ethical context. Uh, telecare traditionally is done for the staff to help manage the environment. And we didn't like that. We wanted to put people in control. Um, so basically, it's around independence control. Uh, is it beneficial? It mustn't be harmful. And when you get to justice, you're into things like best interests. So we have a very strong ethical context. Um, but it essentially asks, makes you ask some very simple questions. What are the issues? We actually don't care what the disability is in terms of technology. Um, if the issue is, I want a light to come when I get out of bed, there's a variety of reasons for that. One is you might fall over. One is you don't know how to turn the light on. One is you might not know exactly where you are. There's a whole range of things. Or for men in the hotel rooms who don't switch the lights on, it's to help them work out where the toilet is. And the outcome's not always what you expect. Now, one of the big issues that really uh, cheeses me off is that people see this and commissioners can see this as added value. John may be at the end over there, he runs a telecare service for Nottinghamshire Housing and maybe at the end John you can say a few words. I would have thought telecare, especially the way we do it, would have been a real option in the recession. It's not. It's been seen as something that you can cut. So I dug out Maslow after all these years um, and if you look at some of the technology there, it's nothing to do with added value. It's actually basic, uh, your biological, physiological needs and your safety needs. So trying to get the message over to commissioners, and if there's any commissioners here, welcome. Um, this is actually a good way of doing business. It's the right thing to do and in a lot of cases it can be cheaper. This is the, <laughs> this is the flying saucer that goes off, goes off at nine in the morning and nine at night. And this red light will send a signal, if I forget to take my meds, it will send a signal to the call centre, and then the call centre will get in touch with the person that's on call. It's made my life easier to have this. Um, uh, it sort of threw me in, and I was quite surprised how something so simple, something so simple like this, would be easier for, my, for me to use for my tablets uh, and things. And it was really, it's really, it's made it, like I say, it's made it a whole lot easier. Uh, that's Jonathan. I've known him for uh, quite a few years. He moved from registered care into supported living or something like, um, I think, in his mid-40s. So he gets more home alone time, he's independent, he's safe, he's, 
obviously you can see the confidence in the guy. This is slow. It saves about six and a half grand a year. Why wouldn't you do it? Um, one of the things that people don't realize is learning disability is actually the second highest uh, social care spend. Um, so there is actually a financial imperative as well as a moral imperative here. Um, in real terms, the spend on adult social care has been growing, whereas other stuff's been cut or been frozen. People should have privacy of their room and, and know that other people can't walk in on, on their room or people that only they choose to have walk in into their room. And for people that can't manage a key or can't retain a key, normal locks are just useless. They just don't have that security. So Tate came up with a suggestion of a fingerprint door lock so that um, you can register your fingerprint and it only ac uh, allows access into the room the person whose fingerprints are registered within the lock. They know that the only people coming into the person's room are people that they can trust. I, I just think it's, it's everybody's right. So you've got a financial imperative there and a moral one. Um, I have actually talked to some politicians and they said, what's the problem? And I said, I can't make this simple enough for you. Or, I sorry, I can't make this complicated enough for you. In, we actually have started to do some impact assessment as a bit later on. Um, this is seven people who moved from registered care to supported living. And what we did is said, if we didn't use technology, what would it cost? So we took the technology, the cost of that out. It actually saves 90 grand a year. Again, why wouldn't you do it? Well, one of the reasons you wouldn't do it is because of the way a commission that currently works, which is an assessment's done if you meet the facts criteria, um, and then you work out how many hours someone gets per week, and then different organisations will tender and say, I'll do it for so much an hour, I'll do it for so much an hour, and so on. Well, I'll go along and I'll say, I'll do it for double the amount, but I'll do it in half the time, but I'll need the money up front. We'll work out, first of all, what someone needs. So I think we've got to get into outcome-led budgeting. It's absolutely vital and transparent budgeting. Um, local authorities or adult social care or CCGs now know that we need to make a margin, not a huge margin. Let's just be clear with them what that is and every few months examine uh, the budget and see how it's going around the individual, around the outcomes we want for that individual. Pauline lives in supported accommodation with Hazel. Both women have a learning disability. With the help of telecare, they don't need full-time carers. I've got a buzzer upstairs in my room, but I don't use it unless if I really have to. If the house gets hot, that's a heating alarm. And that, and that one is a smoking alarm. If the hob gets too hot, that goes off. I'll be safe if, if I have some support from the staff. If other people do it for me, it's just like not that I've been a child. And remember, this is about people's abilities, not their disabilities. Uh, one issue for um, the population I support is that they're likely to get uh, dementia 10 years earlier than the mainstream, or in case of Down syndrome, perhaps 20 years earlier. Um, when I started out, I, I was told that people all died at 40 if they had Down syndrome. They don't. They live to 70 in their 80s. So we have a growing population that deserves better than perhaps we've been done in the past. Uh, another myth is that you throw staff at people. If, you know, so one, one to one, great. Two to one, great. But three to one, the staff start talking to each other and the person gets less support. And this was a study done uh, by the Well Centre for Learning Disabilities um, and they noticed the more staff there, the less attention someone got. We need to do a lot of work with Ross before she has any new technology put into her room because um, Ros finds the thought of it quite scary. So we sit you down don't we we'll yeah. show you some pictures if we've got any pictures yes so, so that she could see what we were talking about we try it for a few days don't we 
yes. and see if you like. Before Roz had the watch, um, she didn't very often ask for help, did you, Roz? No, he did not. No, he did not. But now you've got the watch and you press the button. Yes. And you know that staff are going to come down and ask if you need any help. It's better, isn't it? Yes, Danny, for him. Yeah, you don't mind asking for help now, do you? No. He likes all this. He does, doesn't he? Because yeah. it means it keeps him safe. Yes. And it keeps, keeps him, him safe. And it keeps him well, doesn't it? Yes. He likes himself well. Yeah. And safe. By putting it in the watch, it's an ordinary, everyday item that she was used to having. So that was the best option for Roz, because it was the least invasive. Because you like to keep yourself private, don't you, Roz? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so by being able to discreetly press a button and us go down and assist her, um, it's good for you. Keep it's stunning for you. It's stunning, isn't it? Uh, when you she need talks to do a lot about... of work with oh, Roz sorry. before she has any new technology put into her room. Um, when she talks about him... Uh, it's good for him. She used to be uh, in India in the Raj and it's a little 11-year-old servant boy that she had, which is what she speaks through him. She died a few months ago. Um, the uh, family very happy for us to use a video clip. She died at home. She didn't have to move it out of what she thought was a home, which she would have done. And five other people um, in the same campus site as it was then, which we're now moving on from, died as well, but they all died in their own home. Uh, so one of the things I get, uh, you know, if we're using technology, that's going to uh, cut down social contact. Social contact shouldn't depend on how disabled you are. So the more disabilities you've got, the more staff you get, the more social contact. So if you don't have any disabilities, you don't get any social contact. If social contact is issue, you deal with that. Um, just the, this is we've started doing some uh, research, academic research. Um, it is just proving that people like it. The staff like it, people are more independent, and it saves money. But apart from that, I can't think why you'd use it. Um, however, behind what is a simple solution comes a fairly strong implementation pr process. Um, but it is around the issue. Uh, we have got in HFT a very strong, I've got a team of people who've worked on how to get to what the issue is, look for a solution. There's lots of factors to be taken into account, but the solution might be very simple. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. You'll see the smart house. Um, and in the end, um, you'll see a virtual smart house address. And you can go online, uh, download a virtual smart house, which has a voiceover by Martin Clunes. Next challenge for us is the health. And now with the CCG's new health bits, uh, or challenges, how are we going to cope? The People with learning disabilities have a higher instance of many of things called long-term conditions, yet they don't seem to get access to, to things like telehealth and services like that. So we are really going to have to be fighting the cause. I'm currently involved in one of the Dallas uh, Technology Strategy Board funded projects in Liverpool. Um, we're working with the CCG and we're trying to raise the issue there with them. This is one of the tools that we're going to try and use to raise the profile, which is if there's inequalities, we should fight. But the growth in things like sensors, and if you go and look at the ResCon stand, which is near the Smart House, they've got some unobtrusive sensors which might be able to record people's vital life signs without uh, triggering off some diff difficult behaviours. There are barriers. I don't know if, it, if you're in social care, staff didn't come in to work with technology and so on and so on. Um, getting a hold of technology is difficult because it's prescriptive. What's wrong with you? You have to say something's wrong. Then you go to the doctors or the occupational therapist, no and so on, to get the equipment. We believe you should be able to buy it yourself off the shelf, which is another big fight we're having. Or with personal budgets and personal health budgets, people should be able to buy it for themselves. And the last video clip. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of working with Matthew for about six years now and I have great fondness for him. He's, he's a lovely character. He's got very limited eyesight and hearing but he's very intelligent. There's lots of things that he can do. The technology side of it, it really is for Matthew just to give him a bit more independence 
and choice, really. That's what it's down to. I just think it's amazing. I, can't, I didn't realise there was so much out there. I really didn't think that... Um, I just think it's amazing. They can just do so much. And they're, and, they're, and they're sort of protected and safe. You know, it's just little silly little things like being able to open their door or, or even if they can't open their door, they can open their door by a different method. There's just so much out there that, um, that I wasn't aware of and there's so much out there to help. I have tremendous faith in That's Matt. his dad. And I know his potential. So I'm always kind of, you know, dared to hope that you would be able to uh, get to situations like this. Uh, but no, ne never any guarantee. But even to have Matthew come and be this close uh, and, and just be with is quite remarkable. Um, and... Uh, unusual in many respects. It's, it's just nice. It really is. Uh, you, know, you, you, sort of, you know, when I moved in here, you, you buy a settee, but you never, you never actually think that you're going to be sat on it with your son. You know, you really don't. Matthew had an attention span of about two and a half to five minutes. He'll now sit down and concentrate for two and a half hours. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a smart house. Just before we finish, John, do you just want to say, is there a roving mic? Um, because, John, we were doing this before the recession bit. I thought when the recession it would be a real driver to use technology in a person-centered way. Can you, could you give the mic just to John? Him. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. John Bartle, Nottingham Community Housing Association. Yes, Steve and I were working on this uh, strategy quite a long time ago, oh, well, five or six years now for me. The issue from, that you raised, Steve, earlier on is the one that's absolutely the crusher at the moment is uh, we are a domiciliary care provider, so therefore we go into a lot of people with disabilities homes to provide the domiciliary care package. What we can't move away from is buying half hours, one hours, where that has no need to be bought at all. The solutions that you've been showing today would give the outcomes. If we were paid for the outcomes instead of the hours, you'd get a very different picture. The other thing that we've learned over the last five years is that in fact, when we're ha w using technology, actually, People often talk about re-enablement and being able to withdraw staff. We've also found that we've been able to train people and you don't need to continue to purchase the technology because people can learn and people like the ones that you've shown in that film today. So it's the commissioning that's the problem in my view and people get very scared. They want to put half an hour in, they don't want to put technology in and the only measure they've got is how many hours they've bought. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Thank you all very much. Right, well, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions or comment. Um, anybody want to say, what I love, Steve, is, uh, is your emphasis on abilities, but also about locus of control, because health and, to a large extent, social care often takes power away from people. So I think this is brilliant. So anybody want to make any comments or questions about Steve's work? Uh, people can visit the smart house, which is just down there. Thank you very well, much. in which case, uh, yes, please visit the smart house and thank you.